The essay I'm going to discuss now is by Robert Graves, published in 1960. It's called The Case for Xanthipe. Now, Robert Graves was an English poet and writer, British. Uh, there's some Irish background there as well. Uh, a historical novelist, I think, is what he's known as primarily. He translated uh, many Greek, some Latin texts, and really popularized them, right? So the life of the Caesars, for example, you know, those kinds of works, historical novels. Uh, he's also an art critic to some degree and a poet. He wrote on us, this essay that he wrote, The Case for Xanthipe, is an essay about which we can say two things at the outset. One, that it is a, an essay which takes as its subject matter the old dispute, at least as it has been seen over the centuries in the Western world between poets and philosophers. You can also see this essay, read this essay as an exploration of the place, the necessary place of intuition in developing a moral conception of life. And if I had to think about what it's, what it's, what the onus of the writer is, how, how, how the writer is positioning his, his argument, I think it would be possible to say that according to Graves, we should aim at a life that is reasonable rather than rational. And if we agree that we should do this, then the question is how can we enlist women and poets for this cause, all right? So Xanthipe was the name of Socrates' wife. She's thought to have been an ill-tempered woman, at least that's the, uh, uh, that's the dominant legend. Uh, it, is, it is important to point out that, that Plato uh, is not someone who took that view because the only text of Plato where she is mentioned is the Phaedo or the Phaedo, where she is shown as a very devoted wife and mother. And it is the later writer, Xenophon, who in a symposium, who first spread the view that the wife of Socrates was, a, you know, a, a shrew, a, a woman, a nagging woman. And this idea gets picked up. Um, it becomes the dominant sort of, you know, view of Socrates' wife. Um, and if you read actually uh, uh, Chaucer, uh, The Tale of the Wife of Bath, he actually refers to a story which became, which had become quite prominent. Um, I don't recall now whether it was actually a story that originated with Xenophon or, or perhaps even later, but the story is that, you know, one evening Socrates had come back uh, late in the evening. Typically, he used to spend hours in the marketplace uh, engaging young men in discussion, or they would have, a, you know, a symposium at the home of a friend where they would discuss such, uh, apart from politics, uh, they would discuss subjects such as love, truth, beauty, knowledge, right, virtue, many of the subjects of Plato's, what became Plato's dialogues. Uh, and so he had come back one evening and uh, Xanthipe was in a rage because he had been gone all day as he was typically the case. And so she kind of nags him and scolds him uh, and then empties a chamber pot over his head. And the story is that Socrates' reply was that after thunder comes the rain, right? So this is this is a story that is picked up by Chaucer, and there's a kind of a wonderful, you know, retelling of it uh, in, in verse. 
and uh, the uh, and uh, and Chaucer's tale of the wife of uh, the wife of Bath. Uh, there's also a reference, by the way, to uh, to Xanthipe, uh, and Shakespeare's uh, Taming of the Shrew in uh, in Act One, Scene Two uh, of the play. Um, and it is important to 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 note before I go back to the essay that Xanthipe then just becomes uh, a, a word to designate an ill-tempered woman. It is not necessarily only a reference to the wife uh, of Socrates. Um, so uh, what Robert Graves uh, does here is he sets up this opposition. It's an opposition that goes back of, back of course to the time of uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle to the Greeks between uh, poetry and philosophy. Uh, and as I suggested, where where you see the little twist over here is that he begins the essay actually by making a distinction between between being reasonable and being rational. Um, there is much in this essay that one can disagree with, but there but it but there are so many beautiful and interesting provocations in it that it is definitely well worth a read. Uh, and he says. Um, reasonable has warm human connotations. Rational has coldly inhuman ones. Examine the abstract nouns that both adjectives yield. The stock epithet for reasonableness first used by Matthew Arnold is sweet. The usual epithets for rationality are not at all affectionate. And those for rationalization are often positively crude. I think we would certainly agree with that. Right. So then then he you know, it's it's a short essay. So it's it's very dense because he has he has traversed I mean, the history of Western thought in a way and, and the history of Christianity, as as you will see for yourself if you read the essay and, you know, six, seven pages. Uh, but then he says that philosophy is anti-poetic, philosophize about mankind and you brush aside individual uniqueness which a poet cannot do without self-damage. That is that philosophy tends towards abstraction, towards abstraction. And he's going to suggest now that this was really the issue between Socrates and his Xanthipe, his wife, right? That if you think about Socrates' life and, and, and what do we know about his life? We know about his life really from Plato's dialogues and then of course from, from writers such as Xenophon writing, you know, writing later on, uh, but relying on Plato to a very substantial degree. Uh, what we know is that the dialogues really are what you might describe as exercises and abstraction, right? Um, and Xanthipe's uh, quarrel with him uh, is precisely over this particular issue. So he says, let me break a lance for Xanthipe. Her intuitions were sound. She foresaw that his, that is Socrates, her husband, his metaphysical theories would bring the family into public disgrace and endanger the equipoise of the world she knew. Whenever the rational male intellect, whenever the rational male intellect asserts itself at the expense of simple faith, natural feeling, and sweet reasonableness. There follows a decline in the status of women, who then figure in statistics merely as child bearers and sexual conveniences to men, and a decline in the status of poets, who cannot be given any effective social recognition, also an immediate increase in wars, crime, mental ill health, and physical excess. Right? So, um, what Graves is trying to do here is he's trying to suggest that, you know, look, there are all these stories about Xanthipe as, you know, an ill-tempered woman, a shrew, a nagging wife. And he's saying, of course, you know, this is how we have constructed the figure of the woman who is viewed as an enemy of abstraction, which we link with the male intellect, right? And he's objecting to it. But of course, in some ways, he's actually reinforcing it because the essay is a plea for intuition, right? And he says that, you know, on the occasion when men actually exercise intuition, 
That is, you find a male intellectual who's using intuition and who's therefore deviated a little bit from the standard path of reasoning, then we say, ah, what a genius, right? So in, intuition in a male becomes genius. But he's saying that intuition is what women trade in all the time. That this is the way in which they construct a certain kind of word. And this word actually is a far more reasonable word than the rational word constructed by the male intellect, right? I think, I think that I hope that I have made the argument clear enough, right? But as I su suggested, this is an essay which in many ways really sets, it, sets up the opposition between poetry and philosophy. And what I'm going to read here is just a couple more passages before I move to the conclusion, right? So he says, abstract reason, formerly the servant of practical human reason, has everywhere become its master and denies poetry any excuse for existence, right? So there's a difference between, of course, the different kinds of reason, like reason one, reason two, reason three. Instrumental rationality, for example, is very different than what you might describe as practical rationality, right? Uh, An abstract reason, he says, is different from practical human reason, because practical human reason tends to human good. Abstract reason is an end in itself. Right? And he's saying it's this kind of abstract reason which actually leads to things like the totalitarian state. And, and, and as I said, there is much in all of this which would certainly be cause for disagreement, disagreement among people who have thought about the role of philosophy, the role of poetry, and all of that. But moving towards his conclusion, he says, at our predicament is technological maturity linked with emotional immaturity, right? So it is this, it is this abstract reason, this, this undue emphasis on this way of being rational that has yielded us a certain kind of technological maturity but has also yielded a certain kind of emotional immaturity, emotional immaturity. And with this, I now come to the last paragraph, which I will simply quote and conclude with that. I am no outlaw by temperament. I simply suffer from a poetic obsession, which an increasing number of reasonable people share with me. Poetry for us means not merely poems, but a peculiar attitude to life. I think that that's exceedingly important because when we say, for example, that a person is a poetic disposition, it doesn't mean that the person necessarily writes poetry. It means that they have a certain attitude to life. And this attitude is an attitude which questions the role of abstract reason, the excessive role of abstract reason, the way in which we have glorified it, right? But of course, this is not the extent of what it means to have a poetic disposition. It means a certain kind of empathy, a certain kind of warm feeling of warmth, a certain kind of compassion, a certain way of viewing the word, a certain emphasis on nuance, on irony, and all of that. Though philosophers like to define poetry as irrational fancy, for us, it is a practical, humorous, reasonable way of being ourselves, of never acquiescing in a fraud, of never accepting the second rate in poetry, painting, music, love, friends, of safeguarding our poetic institutions against the encroachments of mechanized, insensate, inhumane, abstract rationality. I think this essay is a very rewarding essay.